The scriptures declared that the coming Christ was going to be a prophet like Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Moses wrote these words, and it was understood by the people in Jesus' day that this was a prophecy of the coming Messiah. In John's gospel, we read about the ministry of John the Baptist, and people are coming to him asking him about who he is. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. During the time of John the Baptist, the scriptures had been completed, and there was an expectation that the people were waiting for the Messiah. The prophet Malachi had declared that Elijah was going to come as a forerunner to the Messiah, and that's the reason for the first question, Are you Elijah? The second question that they asked is, Are you the prophet? The alert reader will see that they didn't ask, are you a prophet? Had the people asked John the Baptist, are you a prophet? Then he would have said, yes, of course I'm a prophet. The prophet was the coming Messiah. This prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18 actually spans from verse 15 to verse 19. So let's look at the whole thing. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire any more, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my word, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. In this brief passage, we see an awful lot of information. The first thing is that God is promising that he will raise up a prophet like Moses. We're going to look at what that means to be like Moses in just a minute. God also includes a detail saying that he will arise from among their countrymen. I know that genealogies are not everybody's favorite part of scripture, but once again, we see that the Messiah would come from among their people. He would be a true descendant from the lines of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, we already saw that the Messiah was going to come from the tribe of Judah. God's reiterating his faithful promise that his prophet, his anointed Messiah, was going to be a true descendant of Abraham. In addition to this, God is declaring that it is good for this prophet to exist because of the need for an intermediary between God and the people. God is responding to the request that the people had when his terrifying presence was amongst them, that the people were afraid, and they knew the fear of the Lord and asked for an intermediary, someone to go into the presence of the Lord and then to come to them and to speak God's words. God said that this attitude was right. Many religions try and set up different intermediaries, but God was saying that he would appoint an intermediary. For this generation, it was Moses, and God would appoint a prophet like Moses for the coming generations. And in the New Covenant, we see that Jesus of Nazareth is that anointed Messiah, and he himself is the one mediator between God and men. Also in this passage, we see that God himself said that this prophet would speak the words of God, that as God's mouthpiece, everything that this prophet speaks would be the very words of God himself, and therefore the people must take heed to the things that are said. If people do not obey the things that this prophet will speak, then God himself will require it of those who fail to believe the testimony of God's prophet. All throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus understood this theme very well, that he spoke the words that the Father sent him to speak, he performed the deeds that the Father sent him to do, and he also understood that whoever received him as the Son of God didn't just receive him, but received the Father who had sent him. And likewise, whoever rejected him rejected the Father also. Many people in that day claimed to have the Father while rejecting the Son, and Jesus said that that was not the case. And in fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 18, whoever doesn't believe the words of the prophet that 
God had raised up was actually rejecting the words of God himself. To reject the prophet was to reject the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as the Messiah came to his own people to be rejected by them, they claimed to have the Father while rejecting the prophet that he had raised up. So what does it mean to be a prophet like Moses? Well, we could go all the way through the books of Moses and we could make our own observations, but probably a better thing for us to do is to simply look at what the scriptures themselves affirm. In Numbers chapter 12, God himself describes what Moses was like. He said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Here in Numbers chapter 12, God demonstrates the difference between other prophets of the Lord and Moses. In other prophets, God communicates with them, but in a more indirect fashion. But with Moses, he communicates face to face. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, when we see then that God is going to raise up a prophet like Moses, we get a sense that this prophet is going to be qualitatively greater than other prophets, that he is going to dwell in the presence of the Lord in a qualitatively different sense. Moses himself dwelt in the presence of the Lord, spoke to him face to face. But you may recall that Moses, in the midst of all this, prayed and cried out to the Lord to reveal to him his glory. And God said that Moses couldn't see that glory and live. Instead, God covered Moses with his hand and caused the greatness of his glory to pass by. And Moses was only able to see the after effects of that, which was still truly glorious. In fact, Moses was able to dwell in the presence of the Lord so much so that when he came down from the mountain, his face was shining. But Jesus, the fulfillment of this, actually dwelt in the full presence of God's glory. In fact, as Jesus prayed before he was to be crucified, Father, restore me to the glory that I shared with you before the world began. Moses was able to dwell in the presence of the Lord much more so than any other human being. But Jesus, being God himself, actually shared the same glory that even Moses had to be protected from. The fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 18 was greater than anyone could have even imagined. That the prophet who was to come was like Moses in the fact that he dwelt in the presence of the Lord and spoke with the Lord face to face, but even to a greater extent than Moses himself did. A final description of what Moses was like is found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34. God's word says this, Since that time no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants, and all his land, and for all the mighty power, and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Not only did Moses dwell in the presence of the Lord, but God's power worked mightily through Moses in working signs and wonders. The prophet that was to come, that would be like Moses, would likewise do great signs and wonders to bring about the glory of God and the knowledge of who he is. This was also fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. In the book of Acts, the apostle Peter, in his second recorded sermon, directly appeals to this passage in saying that Jesus of Nazareth is the fulfillment of this particular prophecy. Peter says, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall utterly be destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your forefathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you, by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Peter understood that the Messiah was the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham and of this promise to raise up a servant, a prophet like Moses, to declare the words of God to the people that those who heed the words and repent, they would be blessed, and those who fail to heed these words would be cut off and destroyed by God himself. In Acts chapter 7, verse 37, Stephen also appeals to this prophecy in his description and proclamation of Christ 
before he's stoned by the ones that he's preaching to. Deuteronomy chapter 18 gives us several things to understand about the Christ. The first was that he would be from among the people, that the Messiah was going to come from the nation of Israel, and the genealogies, therefore, are extremely important. The second thing that this prophecy tells us is that like Moses, the prophet would be one who speaks with the Lord face to face. In fact, the Messiah would fulfill this in a qualitatively greater way than even Moses himself, who exceeded any other prophet both before and after him in all of Israel. The third thing that we are told about this prophet who was to come is that he would speak the very words of God. Some think that Jesus was just a good man or a teacher who had an interesting philosophy. But in fulfillment of this particular passage, we see that the Messiah speaks the words of God himself. That anyone who fails to heed the words of the Messiah, who fails to believe the testimony that he is the Christ and that salvation is found in no one else, will be cut off by God himself. A fourth thing that we see in this prophecy is the role of the prophet, not only to dwell in the presence of God and to speak the words of God to the people, but also to stand in the presence of God and to intercede on behalf of the people when they sin against their God. As we read through the narratives of Moses' life, we see how he constantly is interceding for the people when they sin against the Lord, and how the Lord's wrath is turned away as a result of Moses' intercession. One of the most comforting things that we read about in the New Covenant Scriptures is the fact that Jesus still lives today and that he daily lives to make intercession for his people. This truth should not be an encouragement to you who are in Christ that you would continue in sin. However, we should be greatly encouraged to know that Jesus continues to live today and that he stands in the presence of God the Father to daily make intercession for his people. This is why we can rejoice knowing that his mercies are new every day and that although you and I are very imperfect, that our perfect Savior desires to plead his perfect blood on our behalf. And a fifth and final thing that we see in this prophecy is that the Messiah the Christ, the prophet who was to come, would, like Moses, perform many signs and wonders. You don't have to read too far in any of the Gospels to see that Jesus performed many amazing signs, culminating in his own resurrection from the dead, which declared with power that he is the Son of God and that everything that he spoke in the name of the Father is true. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy, we ought to heed his words because he is the prophet whom God has raised up from amongst the nation of Israel to bless his servants from the nation of Israel and also all the Gentiles who will believe God's testimony concerning his son. However, it should serve as a great encouragement for you and for I, and for, and for I.